So Jonathan, um, thank you for, uh, for joining us uh, today. Before moving into why you joined the Accelera AI board, could you please tell us something about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm Jonathan Ballin. I uh, have lived and worked here in Silicon Valley for all of my career, uh, almost 25 years. And I would say, you know, there's a theme to my interest, uh, which aligns to where I've spent my time over that period, which is really uh, around understanding this world that we live in. Uh, you know, it's it started uh, with startups that were looking at uh, better dissemination of data and helping people to gain access uh, to information, uh, which then traversed into a career at Cisco for a decade, uh, looking at how we move data and move information around the world uh, and really just helping to proliferate uh, the internet and the applications of the internet, uh, which uh, has proven to be a great uh, leveling agent uh, for the world. And then um, I would say most recently, probably the last 10 years has been really focused on, okay, now how once we have that fabric in place, how do we start gaining access to the data in the world that we live in uh, so that we can better understand our lives, we can better understand how things work, uh, so we can improve uh, the human condition. And so the last several years have really been focused on what we now call the edge, right? Which is uh, all of this infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, that exists out in the physical worlds that we inhabit, right? It's in our hospitals, our factories, our cities, and um, and making the most of that to drive uh, human productivity, to improve uh, our healthcare, longevity, education, really anything that can. Uh, further, uh, this this human experience uh, that we have. Yeah, there are indeed a lot of things happening uh, happening at the edge, uh, which you've which you've seen. Right, you're a seasoned executive. You've worked in several Fortune 500 companies, and and if you really look at at AI solutions, uh, for example, or notably edge technology. So, why did you particularly decided to join the board of Accelera AI? Because there are plenty of companies out there. There certainly are, and you know, when I when I think about you know my career, I've worked in both startups and large companies, and you know, each of them are equally valuable, I think, in helping to drive a pervasive adoption of technology. And so, typically, what you see is lots of innovation happening, you know, in startups, right? Because they move faster, yeah. uh, they have less uh, bureaucracy. Um, uh, they're typically smaller, and as a result, you can get very close to the application uh, and the use case. However, it's typically large companies that have the ability to drive pervasive adoption of technology at scale. So you really need both. And when I think about kind of my journey, it's really been focused on kind of three primary uh, areas. Uh, the first is uh, how do we get um, adoption of technology, right? So you look at technology adoption life cycles and what does it take to get something from being novel or interesting, you know, across that chasm and into mass market adoption. And that's been a, a key focus of mine uh, for years. Uh, the second is really around um, access, right? So we want a world in which uh, we don't have the have and have nots. We want there to be an equal distribution uh, of the benefits of technology. And so how do you drive almost a, a, a democratization of access to technology? And that's done, uh, you know, certainly through um, the economics, uh, but also a global reach and global scale, um, as well as providing tools um, to make it so that the accumulation of value doesn't reside solely with the largest companies, the richest companies that can afford access to that um, to the technology as well as access to the talent necessary. And so um, the, the, the democratization, the access, the tools are uh, critically important. And then I would say, lastly, it's really about the application of this technology. And, and it's not just application of technology for novel use cases, but really the understanding of how technology can be applied in a way that's good business, 
right? And that actually has an economic value proposition for the end user. So, you know, when I think about Accelera, I would say there's really um, a couple of things that attracted me to the company. And, and this is true uh, with anything. It starts first with the people, right? Um, I've known uh, uh, our CEO, Fabrizio, for years. Um, he's uh, an incredibly uh, charismatic and passionate uh, leader. But importantly, he not only understands the technology, he understands that uh, those aspects that we were just talking about. He understands uh, how to drive an economic value proposition. He understands how to drive scale in the market because it, it's not just about great technology. It's about how do we get technology um, uh, scaled uh, through the ecosystem and then lastly, it's about, you know, access, right? And so how do we drive availability of technology um, on a global basis uh, in, a, in a fair and equitable way? And I think Fabrizio uh, and the rest of the team really encompass all of those things, right? It's more than just a technology uh, strategy. I would say, secondly, uh, it's about the market, right? I'm deeply passionate about what's happening at the edge out in the real world. And the application of Accelera's uh, focus on this market, I think, is uh, critically important. We're very, very early days uh, in the movement of computing and computing architectures from being uh, kind of focused on cloud computing uh, you know, and the data center and now traversing out to the edge, right? And this is really parallel, you know, is really parallel to what's happening in AI, where you have training happening in the in the cloud, but a lot of inference happens out at the edge. And so this distributed computing architecture that is emerging uh, is really going to require purpose built uh, technology uh, that factors in uh, this, this, you know, this, um, this trend, right, that we're moving towards. And there's lots of aspects and characteristics of an edge to cloud computing architecture uh, that right now uh, are very early and nascent stages in terms of uh, the technology capability, the economics uh, to really support uh, those architectures. So that would be the second reason. And I, the third reason really is just, you know, it's the underwriters, right? It's the people behind uh, the, the funding of Accelera to help bring it uh, to market. And so, uh, as you know, uh, the technology was was incubated within Bitfury, Bitfury being the largest, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin miner, crypto miner outside of China. And in doing so, you know, you see a lot of innovation, right? It comes out of driving a unique scaled operation. So whether it's a purpose-built ASIC or it's liquid-cooled servers or whatever that innovation is, uh, we see a lot of that coming out of Bitfury. And so it's a really important partner, not just financially, but in terms of um, some of the uh, the applications and use cases. You also have iMac, right, with uh, some of the core fundamental intellectual property that's fueling the technology uh, and the technology strategy uh, at Accelera. And then, of course, you have great uh, financial partners as well that are committed to uh, a deep tech full stack solution uh, and bringing that to market. And they understand the complexities of that, right? So we've seen obviously uh, a lot of uh, the press is focused on SaaS companies and SaaS multiples and, you know, all of these software only uh, businesses, but it's really the deep tech that is, uh, you know, it's exceptionally hard. Uh, because you start introducing the aspect of physics, right? Um, and and the physicality uh, of these products. And so having uh, investors that really understand those dynamics uh, and have the ability to represent the, the, the customer and the use case that have the ability to understand the core fundamental technology, as well as uh, financial partners that understand uh, what it takes to bring that to market. All of these things are critically important. So those, uh, all of those, I would say, are very attractive about Accelerate. Great, thank you. 
So you you touched upon the the topic of uh, of markets a bit and as well um, uh, the usage of uh, the usage of data, right? Um, and if we really look at what has been happening over over the past years, data is becoming more and more important, right? Decisions are being made on data more than ever before. Um, how do you see uh, computing really evolving in this in this data driven era? And if you if you look uh, more on a technology perspective. Um, what will be the impact of in-memory computing, for example, and risk-free technology? Yeah, well, I think uh, when you think about this, you know, it starts obviously with the customer and the use case. And you think about how are people going to be using technology and, you know, where we've been for the past, you know, 10, 12 years has really been focused on the economies of scale that are gained through a cloud computing environment, right, which is relatively unconstrained. Right. You have unconstrained compute, you have unconstrained energy, and you're operating uh, in a highly secure and um, supervised uh, environment. Right. And what we're now seeing is this movement towards uh, deep learning. Right. And accessing information out at the edge and the movement of data over communication networks in order to support an inference and training lifecycle. Right. So in order to support that, you can't take these unconstrained models that have been built for the cloud and deploy them at the edge. Right. Uh, it just you, you can't support it from any point of view. The, the, the volume, velocity uh, of data uh, can't support that. Uh, the networks can't support that. But also the use cases, which in many instances require real time processing. I mean, a great example, which is very you know common uh, these days at the edge, is what's happening with autonomous driving. And obviously, it doesn't make sense uh, and would be very dangerous uh, in order to perform uh, an inference workload uh, around autonomous driving if you were sending data, uh, attempting to send data back and forth uh, to the cloud in real time. So we need architectures that can support uh, today local inference with a much reduced and optimized um, neural network uh, algorithm. Um, but we also need computing architectures that can not only support the data movement, but also a much lower uh, energy requirement. So you asked about in-memory computing and risk five. So there's two aspects there um, that are, I think, worth talking about. So one is just when we talk about data and data velocity, data volume, uh, right now, the bottleneck in computing architectures is the data bus, right, which brings the data back and forth between memory and the CPU. So the ability of putting memory in the CPU dramatically reduces the amount of energy that is required uh, in order to perform those calculations, but also increases uh, the speed. So this is uh, very important from a computing architecture, and this will be true uh, in the cloud as well as uh, at the edge, which is why we're seeing such a, a movement towards in-memory computing. Uh, and you ask about RISC-V, you know, historically we've had two architectures, right? We've had x86 and we've had ARM. And, uh, you know, the industry for decades has been focused <clears throat> really on uh, a closed proprietary instruction set, right? And so while in the case of ARM, uh, you know, there is the opportunity to license that instruction set, but all of the, the licensing value go, accrues to, you know, to one company. What's great about RISC-V is that you now have an open architecture and an open instruction set that allows for uh, innovation to happen in a very frictionless way. So now you have the ability um, uh, in a very democratized way for innovation to proliferate um, far beyond, you know, a, a two architecture model. So now we have a third platform, right, that's emerging uh, with RISC-V. And I, I think this is going to be um, just a, a, a really uh, pervasive and widely adopted architecture uh, for all of those reasons. So let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the semiconductor uh, or the AI semiconductor industry in particular uh, for a bit, uh, because 
Uh, if you look at semiconductors, there has been consolidating over the over the past years, right? But if you look at the AI semiconductor industry, uh, how how would you see that, right? Would you see consolidation? And if we really look at the startups, what do you say? Uh, how many startups will perhaps stay independent from five years uh, from now on? Well, you know, I think um, you know hi history is always a good uh, uh, indicator of uh, of the future. And if you think back to what happened in uh, you know, kind of the uh, the early '90s. You know, we had uh, a relatively uh, small number of semiconductor companies that were vertically integrated. They had everything from R and D, uh, you know, all the way through production and, and manufacturing operations. And um, that model was broken, right? And so you started seeing the creation of uh, foundries. Right, and those foundries that focus solely on scale manufacturing um, uh, allowed for the innovation to take place uh, with a much lower barrier to entry, and that's continued to this day. And I think, in fact, if anything, we're seeing a resurgence of that, which is more foundries um, being stood up, more manufacturing capability at scale, and allowing the innovation to take place without the the burden. Uh, of the that capital infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, the skills, the capabilities, the supply chain necessary in order to manufacture. And I think so it actually is creating more innovation, right? Because we now have given companies really of any size the ability to design and build a novel computing architecture. So now certainly, there's not going to be the ability for all of them to be successful, right? Um, so fundamentally, your question was about consolidation. And I think um, what likely will happen uh, is you'll see some of these computing architectures will gain purchase in the marketplace through adoption at scale. Um, and we can talk about what's necessary in order for that to happen. Um, and some will get acquired, certainly. Um, and be part of uh, a, a broader set of capabilities and ecosystem. Um, and then some will just go away. Um, and that's just the nature of uh, kind of startups generally. I mean, uh, in Silicon Valley alone, there are something like 4,000 new startups that are created uh, every year. And uh, only about 10% of them are really successful in any meaningful commercial way, meaning they 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 scale to be uh, 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 a standalone operation. They uh, get acquired, they go public, what have you. The rest uh, tend to falter, and so you know, uh, this is just the nature of innovation. So I, I think um, uh, it's hard to answer your question in terms of how many. Computing architectures and and companies representing those will, will will be around in the future, but I think we're in a uh, a really tremendous uh, moment in uh, in you know the technology industry where we have a huge amount of capital uh, that can now be applied historic levels of capital that can be applied to both the the scale operations right and we're seeing you know record number of you know, factories being uh, built around the world uh, here in the U.S., uh, certainly uh, in Europe uh, and in uh, China and parts of Asia. You know, the, the capital required to do that, $10 billion, uh, you know, for a factory. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, you also see a huge amount of capital going into the innovation around some of these novel computing architectures. So I, I think it's a it's a tremendous time and um, uh, it's it's the companies that uh, that know how to access innovation outside of their four walls, these scaled companies that can tap into that ecosystem, tap into that innovation and know how to harness it, either through partnerships and alliances or through acquisition. Um, I, I think, you know, those will be the ones that will continue to be successful. 
So let's let's look again a bit at the uh, at the AI semiconductor market. Um, some investors they say that it has peaked and it's now getting uh, ready for a severe adjustment. But on the other hand, others think that this slowdown is more temporary and that we really haven't reached the peak because AI is really still at that, that infancy phase and there is a need for new technologies and solutions. I, I, you already talked a bit about that uh, that in in the previous answer. So if if you really look at that, how how do you see that play out? I think we're early days, so I don't think anything's mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at historic R&D spend in, in semiconductors, um, it has increased almost every year for you know for the past 50 years. So that there's no slowdown in R&D spend uh, for for semiconductors. And what you're seeing now with AI is the need for purpose-built um, architectures. Um, so the you know these ASICs, uh, which are application specific. Um, there are many use cases. So right now, you know, uh, we've seen over the last several years uh, a, a huge amount of growth and innovation happening in training, right? Particularly for um, for data centers and cloud. Uh, what we haven't seen yet is scale adoption of uh, applications at the edge, right? And if you look at data as the indicator uh, for these, you know, we're we're seeing, you know, more data being created, you know, in the next year than we saw over the last, you know, 10 years combined. It is just, you know, uh, exponential growth in data. 75% of that data is being generated out in the physical world. It's being generated in factories and hospitals and cities. And, you know, today, a lot of that data is, you know, moving uh, back to the cloud, but uh, it, that won't continue, right? You're going to start to see uh, not only computing architectures, but you're going to see system architectures where inference and training uh, and and uh, storage will happen close to the sensor and as close to the sensor as possible. And again, this goes back to this distributed computing architecture. Right now, um, it tends to be you know uh, edged cloud, but you're going to start to see, I think. Uh, uh, more of these, uh, you know, uh, capabilities close to uh, the point of data origin. And, and again, this goes back to the use cases around things like real-time compute, uh, the ability for systems to not just be smart, but be intelligent. And the, the difference there is something that's smart uh, is something that can think, right? So it's, you've got a fixed function program uh, capability uh, so you've got that device or that system uh, uh, can be smart about whatever function it's performing. Where we're moving towards is in a set of intelligent systems. The difference between smart and, and intelligent is smart can think, intelligent can learn, right? And so we're not going to be moving the world's data back into the cloud for training. A lot of that is going to happen out close to the source of the data. And so I think um, you know that distribution um uh will change communi uh, communication networks uh it will change uh the algorithms uh that we write uh because they're going to need to be more constrained for uh, a lower uh footprint in terms of energy uh, uh and and cost uh capability uh out you know out at the edge So that, that's 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 really interesting, right? And um, if you if you really really look at at the opportunity, uh, the edge. Uh, if you really compare it to to cloud, it's 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 relatively relatively small, and it's still way too fragmented, perhaps, to be efficiently served. What do you think about that? Well, I think uh, the cloud's not going away, and the cloud will continue to grow and and to be innovative. I'm not uh, suggesting. Uh, that it won't. But what I am suggesting is that the, you know, be, because the data is being generated at the edge and because the data needs to be analyzed, processed, moved and stored at the edge, um, there is just a uh, really untapped market uh, for all of these uh, layers, uh, you know, of the stack. Uh, out in the in the physical world, and so you're going to see a tremendous amount of growth uh, as a result of that. Um, 
right now we're seeing uh, obviously a lot of discussion around what's happening with uh, with vehicles and transportation um, where you've got basically a mobile data center in the back of uh, of a car um, you know all of these devices that can compute and connect to the network will right and when that happens it changes by definition the network itself so the network has historically been uh, Ethernet ports, routers and switches, you know, moving data around corporate networks, um, uh, you know, carrier infrastructure, uh, cloud and data center. Well, now, um, you know, any device can be a node in that network and participate in that network. And so what will happen from an AI point of view is we go from these narrow use cases to more broad use cases. And then eventually we get to, you know, general AI where you're looking cross domain and, you know, the application uh, uh, of insights that are available when you start being able to harness data from, uh, you know, multiple different sources. Um, it just creates a, a step function order of, uh, of uh, insight uh, that will be available to us, you know, as we as we move through this journey over the next, you know, 10 to 20 years. You mentioned data being in a, being a very important element here. Um, is data, is would that be the driving factor for an AI company to succeed, succeed at the edge or would it be something else? Well, I think it's a factor, right? So having mm -hmm. the ability to access data um, and to do that in a very cost effic efficient uh, way, in a very energy efficient way, um, uh, is certainly going to be important, but you also factor in uh, all kinds of other characteristics of the physical world that don't exist in a uh, in a cloud environment, or I should say, they're controlled for in a cloud environment. So things like physical security of that device, right? I mean, if you visit uh, a large uh, cloud uh, operations, you've got uh, tremendous amounts of physical security and redundancy. You've got temperature control and all of these things. When you have devices at the edge, uh, you know they need to operate 24/7, oftentimes for years. Um, uh, so there's not always an opportunity for uh, you know reboots and software updates and upgrades and redundancy, right? Uh, you also have uh, the physical world, uh, which creates you know hot, harsh and extreme environments, right? Where you have uh, dust, you have, uh, you know, extreme temperatures, you have vibration um, and other things that you need to factor in. So the edge is just a very, very different um, uh, uh, world. Um, and depending on the use case, uh, you may need to be operating in real time right, and have the ability to process information uh, in real time. And, you know, in the software industry, you know, real time is measured in, you know, seconds. Uh, in computing architectures at the edge, uh, real time is measured, you know, in uh, in milliseconds or nanoseconds, right? Um, and it could be the decision between, uh, I mean, you look at robotics, for example, um, you know, the ability to have zero latency uh, in the uh, control system, uh, is critical for uh, precision. It's critical for safety. Um, so it's just it introduces a whole new set of uh, challenges uh, that that are being solved for. So let, let's talk about the, uh, the the changes in the in the global market in terms of semiconductors, right? Because there has been happening uh, there has been happening a lot. Um, the U.S. government, for example, uh, ensuring the semiconductor supply chain uh, with the Chips Act. Uh, the EU government as well uh, relaunching the semiconductor ecosystem with the EU Chip Act. Um, and then as well, we have China at, at the other side uh, making impressive investments uh, in the AI semiconductors and really fueling the internal demand there. And not to forget Taiwan and Korea really pushing to strengthening their position in the market. So a lot of things are, are happening globally. And if you really look, uh, put it into perspective uh, and look at, let's say, the, the, the coming 10 years, how do you see that evolve? You know, it's interesting. I um, 
I think a lot of people uh, see this as a retreat from globalization, right? Uh, where they're starting to um, uh, insource uh, and localize a lot of capability uh, in order to protect national interests and security. And certainly there's aspects of that, but the reality of the market that we're in um, when you get down to uh, materials, uh, raw materials, um, as well as sophisticated um, equipment necessary for production at scale, there really is no country that can completely vertically integrate and be successful in semiconductor. It requires a global community. So lots of talk around you know, uh, the risk of, for example, TSMC, the largest, you know, uh, foundry in the world, and what would happen if China were to uh, to take over Taiwan, that factory would shut down. It can't operate solely within Taiwan. I mean, certainly it has uh, tremendous capabilities that serve a global market, but it receives uh, supply and parts and equipment from all over the world. So, um, it really is a global supply chain. And so I think what we're seeing now is a, um, a political uh, acknowledgement and recognition of how fundamental silicon is to the success of any nation state um, in terms of national security interests, uh, but also just the, the health and well being of uh, its citizens across every industry and you know the supply shortage that we've seen in semiconductors over the last several years has made that painfully obvious and so i'm you know very enthusiastic that we're now seeing national uh investment uh programs subsidies um and other you know benefits in order to support uh the growth necessary um uh, because this really does need to be a public private um, you know, collaboration uh, in order to supply the, you know, the fundamental building blocks of innovation for the world. So this is all very good things, but um, I, I don't see it being a retreat from globalization at all. Um, I see it really being a shoring up of capabilities and, um, and really the creation of capacity to support um, an ever-increasing demand for computing. Great. So let's um, let's finally. I really would like to uh, to look at the uh, at the edge markets. And uh, you already mentioned quite some. Uh, we're talking about automotive. Uh, I think you briefly talked about the industry for for uh, I think a bit about retail too. Um, but there is just so many possibilities, or there's so many possibilities for for disruption by artificial intelligence. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Um, what would you say if you really look at some of the top three edge market? What, what 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 would those be, and what kind of applications would then ultimately be more impactful in our daily life? Well, I think you know what we've seen. I would say over the past you know seven years has really been uh, a focus on first natural language processing. Right. And the ability to change the human machine interface using voice. Right. Um, we see that uh, in our homes uh, with any uh, voice assistance uh, that, that we may use. Uh, but you can also see it in like a healthcare environment or an industrial setting where you have a worker that needs to be able to use you know, both of their hands in the performance of some complex task. And so the ability to now control a system using your voice uh becomes a very powerful uh, hmi uh we also now um over that similar period have seen better than human accuracy in image analytics and so it started with uh being able to identify a cat or a dog uh, in a photograph um that moved into being able to analyze very dense and complex um, uh, medical imaging. Uh, so if you look at an MRI image, one single image, for example, can be terabytes in scale. 
the amount of data that exists in um, one of those images is tremendous. And being able to apply deep learning algorithms to find anomalies better and faster than a tr uh, one of the world's most trained radiologists uh, is providing a huge amount of benefit, not only to the radiologists that have been overwhelmed with uh, with images uh, more than they can possibly uh, observe, uh, but also better health outcomes as a result, because not only can we now uh, derive insight from the image, but we can then uh, apply uh, that to other uh, data sets and fuse those together to get not just a, a single diagnosis of what's happening in that image, but now to apply this to population health records and look for insights that can give us better um, understanding of what caused uh, those um, anomalies uh, or health you know, issues uh, in the first place. Now we're seeing those same image uh, analytics uh, applied to video, right? And happening uh, in real time, everything from object detection, object tracking, facial recognition, um, which is now at a point where we can understand not just, you know, um, who is in an image, but how are they feeling? What are they uh, likely uh, doing? And we can start to understand behavioral analysis, right? Um, in video images, which to me, like uh, an image sensor, it's the ultimate sensor, right? Because you can see what's happening uh, in the world. We'll now start to take in other sensor types, sound, smell, vibration, um, and, uh, you know, applying all of these things together um, to get towards more of a, a generalized AI where we start looking across domains, across data sets, um, and just getting a very robust understanding uh, of the world we live in, which today is around analysis, right? What is it? Um, and then moves into what do we do about it? And um, eventually, when we feel things are safe and um, predictable, uh, we can start allowing for some degrees of autonomy, right? Um, and so I see this journey from understanding what the data is telling us to having it make a recommendation of what we should do in that scenario, but still requires a human to take action towards getting towards autonomy. Right, and that autonomy can be a car making a decision to swerve or brake. It could be uh, in robotics, um, where you have an unsupervised, um, you know, robotic system um, performing tasks and learning uh, from uh, a, a dynamic environment. Um, all of these things are going to start to pervade uh, our lives, and in the process, allow humans to move to a higher order of uh, value creation and skill set, because a lot of things that are historically uh, mundane can be automated. Things that are dangerous can be automated. Things that are dirty. Uh, all of these things now allow um, the human experience, again, to, uh, to improve. Great. Jonathan, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you.